folks, and welcome to this, the November 9, 2009, regular monthly meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. I would ask Clerk Deborah Lane to please read the roll call. Chairman Rowe? Here. Councillor Backer? Here. Councillor Jordan? Here. Councillor Lennon? Here. Councillor McKinney? Here. Councillor Sherman? Here. And Councillor Swift Kayata? Here. Thank you. Uh, please rise and uh, join me in a pledge of allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Uh, town Council reports and correspondence. Uh, I would first wish to thank uh, Clerk Deborah Lane and her able assistants for another great job in administering the most recent uh, election process here in town. I think while many voters uh, maintain the tradition of, of voting on election day, uh, the reality is that with a heavy reliance on absentee uh, voting, the job for the clerk and her assistants has changed a great deal over the last few years. It, it now is spread over a much longer time, and I think our crews do a marvelous job in uh, accommodating everyone, so thanks, Deb. Uh, I'd like to thank all the citizens who did cast ballots this year. Once again, I think Cape Elizabeth has to be at or near the very top uh, in voter turnout percentage-wise uh, of Maine municipalities. And I thank uh, and congratulate those citizens who have had the courage to put their names on the ballot in our local elections this year. Having gone through that process twice myself, um, I can't emphasize enough to the uninitiated uh, how difficult it is to put your name and yourself out there uh, for the public to judge. We were fortunate to, to have strong fields in both of our town council and school board races this year, offering voters some real choices. Uh, special gra gra congratulations go to the winners in those races, our own Sarah Lennon on her re-election. Um, Sarah will be joined, of course, by the already sitting councillors, uh, Ann Swift-Beata, uh, Dave Sherman, and Penny Jordan, and will be joined by newcomers uh, Jim Walsh, Jessica Sullivan, and Frank Governale. The school board will benefit from the input of three new members, uh, Mary Williams Hewitt, David Hillman, and John Christie. So again, uh, congratulations and thanks to all. Uh, other reports and correspondence? Paul? Uh, two things. First of all, um, I have the honor this year of serving as the Appointments Committee Chairman. We're right in the middle of the process, but once again we, we have more people volunteering for positions than we have positions to fill. So it's, it's just a great testament to the uh, citizens of Cape Elizabeth that they want to be involved in their government and they want to participate. We have a, a dozen, is it a dozen or maybe 13 boards and commissions with anywhere from six to uh, uh, six to s seven people on each each board, it's just really great to see so many people out there and involved. I just wanted to say we have some great candidates, and uh, I want to thank everybody for applying. Thank you, Paul. David. Yeah, I'd like to just say a word since this is my last evening um, after six years on the council. And I want to say a couple things about that. Um, it, first of all, being a boat owner, and for those of you who are boat owners, you'll appreciate the analogy to the two purported happiest days of a boat owner's life. <laughs> and I think for an elected official, it's quite similar. The, uh, the euphoria of the day you're elected and the feeling that I have tonight walking out of here thinking this is my last meeting. <laughs> it feels pretty good. But I want to thank um, the citizens of Cape Elizabeth for the opportunity to have served for six years because it's been a wonderful experience. And it's been a wonderful experience for a few reasons. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of my fellow counselors for making the experience the wonderful experience that it has been. Um, for all who are currently sitting, who I've had the pleasure of serving with, and those who came before some of you who are sitting here now, um, 
and specifically um, Marianne Lynch, uh, Cynthia Dill, uh, Carol Fritz, John McGinty, um, Jack Roberts, all of whom served during my tenure. Everybody who has served on this council has served with a great generosity of spirit and you can watch the council debate any particular issue that might be on the agenda and we vote and it may be a unanimous vote, it may be 5-2, it may be 4-3, but we move on to the next agenda item and we have never in the six years that I've been on the council carried personalities into the chamber with us or from one issue into another. And for those who have watched the council over the years, one thing that will hopefully impress you is that there have never been voting blocks on the council. Um, nobody has ever been able to come to a meeting and say, oh, well, I know that this person will always vote with this person. That's never the way it is. Sometimes we vote together. Sometimes we vote on opposite sides of an issue, which is exactly the way it should be, um, which tells you that everybody is voting their conscience for what they truly believe is in the best interest of the town. And it has been an honor to serve with people who I think um, and have always felt um, have served on the council for all the right reasons. There certainly isn't any pay in this. Um, um, people do it because they're simply trying to give back in some way um, to improve the town of Cape Elizabeth. We always hear people talk about preserving the rural character. We hear, we hear people talk about preserving and protecting the excellent education system we have here. But we have another resource here that is often overlooked and isn't mentioned and that is the incredible volunteer pool of citizens that we have that come forward daily on all our different boards and commissions to help. We have an incredible talent pool and without all the volunteers, without that resource, this town would not be what it is today. Um, so it's been a pleasure not only to have worked with the counselors, but it's also been an incredible pleasure to have served with all the volunteers who have come forward. And last, I want to thank the town manager, who I have thanked before at various times during my tenure, but the, the town is fortunate to have had the consistency of a manager who has talents that I have come over the course of the six years to appreciate more and more each year. Mike was impressive in year one. He is more than six times as impressive at the end of year six. Um, he does a great job and I just want to thank Mike for the opportunity. I have learned much from serving, um, I won't say under him, but serving with him um, because in the uh, charter, under the town charter, the town manager serves under the council. But Mike has uh, certainly educated all of us and has taught us all a lot um, about leadership skills. Um, and I want to acknowledge that and thank him. And um, I have never deluded myself into thinking that somehow the town would not go on without me. There, again, one of the great things about living in this town is that there are so many talented people who are very capable of doing a wonderful job on the council. And I'm pleased to see that there was, a, that there was so much interest um, in this last selection, and I have no doubt that we will be well served in the years ahead. So, anyway, thank you all. Paul. Thank you, David. Thanks, David. I, I too, want to thank the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, and I want to say it's been a real honor and privilege to serve over the past five years. And this was actually the second point I wanted to make, but I wanted to let David go first. <laughs> Um, but it's been a real honor and privilege and what you learn and what I have learned on the council is there's a big difference between politics and governance. Politics is about getting elected, it's about taking your position to the people, but when you get elected you have to set politics aside and focus on governance and that's what we do and that's what we do so well and it's been wonderful to work with so many talented people here on the council and to work with a manager who's really an international leader in his own right in the largest um, volunteer organization in the world, Rotary International. 
and to work with such a talented staff, the, the deputy and the assistant town manager and all of the department heads. We have a wonderful town, a wonderful community. We're very fortunate, and it's been my privilege to serve uh, on this council. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Clearly, I need to upgrade the security, upgrade the security on my computer because both these guys have stolen my speech. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I would ditto the remarks of, of both the, the preceding uh, speakers. Um, I particularly want to thank the 3,530 uh, citizens who, who voted, if not in support of me uh, three years ago, uh, they were at least willing to give me a chance. And it's been the greatest uh, opportunity uh, outside of, of marriage and family and so forth in my entire life serving this town. Uh, this town is something that I love. Um, I've tried hard, I haven't always succeeded, I know I haven't always pleased people, but at the end of the day I can hold my head up and know that I've uh, done my best to do a good job and I think you can't ask for more than that. I particularly echo the comments uh, of uh, Paul and David with regard to the employees that we have here in town. We have a, an incredible uh, staff, uh, rank and file workers, department heads and administrators and none better than, than the gentleman to my left. Um, he's highly regarded, uh, not only here in town, but among his peers in other towns whom I've come in contact with. And uh, I just realize uh, weekly, if not daily, how fortunate we are to have uh, the administrative leadership that we do in Cape Elizabeth. So thank you, Mike. Uh, and thank you all again. Other reports and correspondence? I have one more report. Um, oh, Dan, I saw you reaching for your mic. Well, I wanted to um, say thank you to the counselors who are leaving us. And um, I also in particular wanted to thank our outgoing chair. Jim Rowe has been on the town council three years. So his last year has been as chair. He's shown himself time and time again as an honest and principled advocate and a representative of all the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, especially those of more modest means. And I think that's been important. Jim is patient, and he's calm, and he uses humor wisely, something we could all do probably, to diffuse tension. And Jim, you, I know you have worked tirelessly to build consensus in your time on the council. It's been an especially hard task, given the recent terrible economy and the pressures that our citizens and our town have been under. But I would say, when I was thinking about um, what I wanted to say tonight, I think that you have the two key qualities, I think, that make an effective counselor. You listen, which is a rare talent, and you are respectful of and toward everyone that you encounter. You've been a great counselor, as have the other two, but um, I wish you had all stayed longer. Um, but again, the town will go on, certainly. Um, but we will miss you all, and Jim, I have a gift from the town for you as a token of our esteem. I don't know if I can go on. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I have to say one other thing, which was that Mike McGovern was, was going to introduce me, but I just hopped in and did it. And he said, now, do you want to be known as, I'm going to introduce you as the oldest counselor. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, don't do that. Introduce me as the longest tenured counselor, but not the oldest one. So anyway, thank you again. Thank you very much, Ann, and, and thanks again to my colleagues uh, for their support during this year. Um, now I'm pleased uh, to announce uh, that the newest recipient of the Ralph T. Gould Citizenship Award here in Cape Elizabeth is Michael Ott. Um, while Mike did have tremendous help from a fine committee and would no doubt deflect much attention toward them, uh, he would have to be identified as the driving force and the figurehead of the effort to build Hannaford Field. His enthusiasm for the project and his foresight and vision of what it would mean to our community were instrumental in bringing this from concept to reality. To have a central outdoor gathering place and state-of-the-art facility like Hannaford Field 
will be an important part of not only our school campus, but of our entire town for many years to come. Unfortunately, the arts uh, left Cape Elizabeth a couple of months ago uh, due to a career move for Michael. Uh, I've unsuccessfully tried to lure him back to Cape Elizabeth uh, to receive this award along with our accolades, but his busy work schedule is not permitting this. On the bright side, though, we have been made aware of the fact that one of our counselors elect, Jim Walsh, and his wife Kathy have plans to dine with the Ots later this month in New York City. And so uh, what I think would be appropriate, uh, rather than to allow this presentation to hang in limbo indefinitely, uh, I would propose that we designate uh, Jim Walsh to be our um, uh, ambassador or emissary to deliver the Ralph Gould plaque to Michael along with the declaration of our profound thanks and our best wishes. Um, I'm perhaps the only member of the sitting town council and perhaps even the staff to have actually known Ralph Gould. Uh, Ralph and Louise Gould lived at number 31 Forest Road uh, which was behind the house where I grew up on Cottage Farms Road. Mr. Gould was both a wonderful and a very interesting man. He was a real character in the good sense of the word. He usually wore a beret and drove a French Citroën automobile. He always had a friendly way for us kids in the neighborhood. He was a philanthropist. He was the donor of an absolutely incredible collection of ancient musical instruments, which I believe are still on display at the Bixler Art Building at Colby College in Waterville. For many years, he sponsored a competition for area high school musicians, in which I had the honor of representing Cape Elizabeth High School one year. He was one of those rare individuals who, if you approached him with a well-defined and reasonable need, had the means and inclination to open his bank book and help out. If you need to have a picture accompanying the definition of the word citizenship in the dictionary, you would be well served to have a picture of Ralph Gould. We're pleased to add Michael Ott's name to a long and growing list of those Cape Elizabeth citizens who have made a tremendous difference in our town. I know that Jim Walsh will do a great job at conveying that message to Michael when he sees him later this month. So uh, thank you for your offer, Jim, and uh, congratulations and thank you to Michael Ott, wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs> Any other reports and correspondence? Uh, we'll now offer our first opp opportunity for citizens uh, to address items that are not on this evening's agenda. So if you would like to speak to an item that is not on tonight's agenda, I'd ask you to come to the lectern now. Seeing no much motion in the audience, uh, we will move on to the town manager's report. Yeah, I will be very brief because the, the hour is getting late even though it's still early. I just want to join in thanking everyone for all of the services. Uh, this is on the town council. This is not only the, the night that uh, three councilors retire from the town council, it's also the final meeting of, of this particular town council. And, uh, you know, it, it hasn't always been easy this year. There's been some challenging zoning issues, some particularly challenging economic times. And, uh, you know, my, I think the council uh, with the leadership of Jim has really provided tremendous leadership uh, on all those issues. And I, I want to, you know, express my appreciation to, particularly to the, the retiring councilors that, you know, after a while sitting here, they be, they're not only professional associates, but you also become friendly as well as you, as you work on the different issues involved. So I appreciate their support, their friendship, and most of all, their dedication uh, to the, the principles of good governance here in Cape Elizabeth. And, uh, and all that applies equally as well to our chairman. Uh, I think Ian captured it well. So thank you, Jim. Thank you, sir. Um, review of the minutes of the meeting held October 14, 2009. I'd entertain a motion. Move to accept. Second. Move and second to discussion on the motion. Seeing none, all approve, uh, all in favor of uh, approving the minutes, unanimous, thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is a public hearing, uh, and this will be regarding proposed amendments to the traffic ordinance. Uh, Sarah, would you, either you or Neil like to set this up for us before we open? Um, do you want me to just briefly introduce it, and then you can go? Just go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
Uh, I was just going to say the parking regulations that we have before us that we're here to discuss um, involve two specific requests. One was from um, the Chief of Police, Neil Williams, to review parking at the ocean side of the ocean end of Surf Road and Cottage Lane. Um, the other was a request from a citizen to review parking um, near 551 and 553 Shore Road. The Ordinance Committee decided to put that particular decision off until the changes that the Planning Board had recommended had been put into place. However, we did visit <coughs> the first suggestion from Neil and um, solicited public input and emails and reviewed it ourselves. And what you have before you in the packet is the proposal we came up with. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to the Chief of Police to go through the details. The Would you also like to show, me, show some pictures? Yeah, love it. Thank you. Should be right behind me in a second. Um, what precipitated this is uh, actually uh, many, many years ago um, that I can remember, even as a kid growing up in that particular area is that uh, Cottage Lane gets congested when we have a nice day in the summertime and people attend the beach at Casino Beach. Um, it's been... Excuse me? Uh, and so when it's been congested there, which is uh, depends on the weather for that particular summer, this uh, particular summer, Past, we didn't have all that many great days down there in in, uh, in in for weather. I don't know what light you can hit. There, there you go. That's it, Jim. And um, so it, it may not have been as uh, many days as it has been in the past. Uh, but I have gotten requests in the in the uh, past years to address the parking situation down in the Cottage Lane area. This. This picture here shows a, a cottage lane from Shore Road down towards Maiden Cove Lane. Um, we have parking, no parking on the right-hand side going down. Um, I think I took this picture so it visually shows that the road is quite wide in this area and um, one, one side parking is appropriate for this particular area. Um, as we move along, um, we'll see that this particular area is the little um, short street surf road, uh, I'm sorry, uh, cottage lane coming down towards the intersection of surf road and, uh, and um, garden lane. And as you can see, if one vehicle parks on this roadway, it boxes it up and therefore no vehicle traffic can get by that. Uh, maybe a small, small vehicle, motorcycle, but definitely not a rescue nor a fire truck could get by that vehicle. Um, as you can see, the two vehicles in the back, the one to the right and the one to the left, they are also up there. This is a nice day in the summertime. Uh, we were fortunate to get this particular vehicle uh, moved right away. But you can see how it can jam up traffic very, very quickly. After this happened, what we did was we put uh, barricades along where that vehicle is and uh, it worked until the barricades were taken up during Beach to Beak and when uh, they were supposed to be left, but uh, Public Works didn't know they were supposed to be left. Um, as you look at this particular picture, that would be looking down from that particular vehicle down where um, Surf Road comes in. That's, that car is actually parked on, on a little part of the Surf Road and then Garden Lane goes down into Garden Circle on the right. Um, I took this picture, as you can see, it is very, very narrow. So should somebody park in that particular area, again, it would uh, make it uh, not useful for emergency vehicles to get by. Um, I think you can also see the cinder blocks on the left-hand side. That was not done by us. I think that that was done by a neighbor in that particular area, trying to discourage people from parking in that area. That's back up the road where the vehicle was parked. Um, that's without the vehicle there, obviously. But you can see that it's still rather narrow. 
This particular area is uh, from uh, the end of Surf Road looking up towards uh, Surf Road that would go to the left. That would be your Maiden Cove daycare right there, the building, and it would be going up to the left. You can see that if any vehicle parked in that particular area, that also would jam it up. So if you had a vehicle parking on both areas of that Y, you would not be able to get any uh, emergency vehicles down through to Garden Lane or Garden Circle or the end of Surf Road, in my opinion. That would be looking up a little bit further up towards Surf Road. You can see the vehicle on the right-hand side. The um, um, street sign on the left is uh, Keys Lane. That is my car parked down there just to give you some type of idea of what a vehicle would be uh, if it was parked in that area. You can see an old sign that was put, put in quite a long time ago that uh, is there for no parking, but it's only one sign. That again is a little further away. Uh, this is from the top of Surf Road, uh, coming down from Shore Road looking into where it would turn right, Surf Road, and then going down into Garden Lane. Um, I spoke to that lady in that uh, particular home when I was doing these pictures in the blue home, and uh, she was quite thankful. Actually wanted the barricades back. This would be a picture from Cottage Lane going down Maiden Cove. You can see the narrow part of that. You can also see that there was, there's a parking, uh, no parking sign on the right-hand side in the left hand side in that particular area. Um, if I showed you the picture, uh, the first or second picture where the um, station wagon was parked in the, in the, in the um, little area that would uh, block up uh, Cottage Lane, there was a vehicle that was parked on the right hand side in the back. It was a gray van and that was parked in that no parking zone. This is uh, Maiden Cove going down towards the water. You can see how narrow that is and how, how one vehicle could uh, possibly uh, crowd that area. And back to Cottage Lane. And um, so um, with that being said, um, myself, uh, the manager, and the public works director went down to see what would be the best solution that we thought that we could propose to the neighbors down there in order to curb the um, onslaught of parking during, and you'd have to take into account the weather that particular summer. It could be a light summer like we just had, or it could be a heavy summer, depending on whether we had good weather or not. But we are trying to take into account, um, one, not just signing the area crazy, so everybody, uh, everybody and every resident had a no parking sign in front of their house, or um, could we do it in such a way as to try to take in account those particular days where it, it, it didn't necessarily mean all summer long, but it only meant a couple of those heavy days. So what our proposal was, was to uh, make no parking down, on, continue the no parking down on the right-hand side of Cottage Lane, to put a sign at the beginning of Maiden Cove Lane going down from Cottage Lane that would say resident parking only, to um, have no parking um, going down, and, and sometimes people get confused, we call it Cottage uh, Lane going down towards Garden Circle, so it would be that particular y, end of the Y, and 60 feet, we, we calculated out about 60 feet on Surf Road, from Keys Lane. Now what that would take into account, I know the residents are here and I'm sure the person that is here, I think maybe is here, but there's a home there and she has a little turn in there. Didn't want to take that away from the person because the person made that little turn in and it doesn't affect traffic as far as I'm concerned or emergency vehicles that is getting down there. So from after that and on the left side going down Surf Road towards the water would be no parking. And then um, we would attach a residence parking only sign to a post that was in that um, 
triangle where the person had put the cinder blocks. That way we are trying to um, assist the residents down there with not having all the area signed in front of their house for them to be able to park their own vehicles on the roadway and also to try to limit the traffic that comes down through there without um, hindering um, emergency vehicles for their care should they need it or their house be on fire. Um, I think that takes care of any of the cottage lane area that um, we had looked at. I don't know if you want to take it separately, all together. Why don't you set the whole thing up because we're okay. going to open up the hearing for, uh, for everything. So. And then um, just so in, instead of going before the ordinance committee several times, <coughs> it was uh, suggested that we just look at everything if we could throughout the town without, you know, posting everything crazy. So uh, what we looked at was we looked at a couple of sections of the traffic ordinance and um, we found that we had a problem in um, section 13-2-2 which would be subsection L which had previously said or it says now that you um, can't pay, park on a paved or improved surface of any street, way, road when it's practical to park anywhere else. Well, that would mean the police department would have to go to every neighborhood and say, you can't park on the street when your driveway is empty. Now, that's, that to me is not an appropriate use of our traffic ordinance and not what I feel the residents of Cape Elizabeth really want. So I, I would um, recommend that that be struck. Throughout the ordinance, it states uh, it takes care of the areas um, through, on the proposals, that is, takes care of the areas through the surf road area and cottage lane area that I had just previously asked for. And then, if you look at 13-2-4, limited parking, we would like to um, add um, H, and that would be a box truck, cargo van, tractor trailer may be parked overnight on any public road for not more than one night each year. Any such parking shall be in violation of any other section of these parking regulations. The reason we've had that is because we've run into a problem where we've had um, homeowners bring, bring their box trucks home. Uh, they've parked on the street there is enough room to get by, but it limits their neighbors in seeing uh, coming out their driveway or coming around a corner. We feel that that's a hazard. We've tried to handle that, um, I think, community-oriented by asking them please not to do that, and we haven't got results out of that. Um, also, we would recommend um, that on 13-2-4 limited parking, we add I, and that would be an equipment trailer, boat trailer, or any or other hauling trailer may not be parked overnight on any public road for more than four consecutive days or for eight days in any consecutive four months. Any trailer parked on any public road at any time shall have a wooden block or similar device in place under, under the trailer tongue to avoid permanent damage to the road surface. Obviously the permanent, uh, the, the wooden block underneath, uh, you know during hot days when a, when a trailer is loaded and it's taken off, of the, off the tongue of a truck that uh, it will dig into the roadway and that does not get the public works director very happy, I can tell you that. And um, if it's legally parked and it's registered, um, right now, we, we can't do a whole bunch about it. Excuse me, uh, Ann? I just want to make sure, I'm not sure if I misheard or not, um, Chief. Uh, that last thing you were talking about, uh, the trailers may not be parked overnight on any public road for more than four consecutive days. And what I have in front of me says, or for eight days in any calendar year. If, if that was changed, 
I, I didn't print off the correct copy. Yeah, the, you did not print out the correct copy. Okay. okay. I just I, wanted to make Shane sure. Shane corrected on that. Thank That's you. That's okay. Council, could you, could you say that one more time so the neighbors could hear that? Yes. It's, um, it says, an equipment trailer, boat trailer, or other hauling trailer may not be parked overnight on any public road for more than four consecutive days or for for eight days in any calendar year. Thank you very much. I did see that revision and I didn't print off the correct copy. I stand corrected. Um, and that's, uh, that's to try to give a little leeway if somebody wanted to bring their boat home from uh, one of the places down South Poland, work on it, uh, the problem with the engine, they need to clean it or something like that. That's fine. No, no problem with that. But what we're finding is, is that people are just parking their trailers on the, on the uh, roadway, and then we'll finally get a call. I think one of the counselors got a, got a call when we, when we uh, um, a, a approached this idea and said, well, I can, uh, I can agree with that because we've had a trailer parked for three months out here. They don't necessarily call us until they really have a problem with it, and then they say that it's happened that way, and, and if it's registered, we have a problem in trying to get them to move it. Although I will say that most residents have, most residents have been uh, very nice and moved it for us when they find out that their neighbors have finally called on it. But we have, we, we, need, to, we need to dress that up a little bit. Okay. And I think that's all my recommendations. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, the questions of the chief before he leaves the microphone. I have a question. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I read through this and just points of clarification because as I read it, the implication to me is that cars can be parked. Any streets that aren't specifically stated in here, cars can be parked on any other of those streets for extended periods of time except between the dates of December 1st and April 1st. That's correct. Okay. They have to be registered though. They have to be registered, but they can park, on, as long as the street isn't specifically in here, they can be parked for extended periods of time. Correct. Okay. Okay. That would go up, that go through the whole ordinance if there's if it's, not state, if it's not stated as a road in there that there's no parking, then you can park your vehicle. So there could be a car on, um, I'll just throw out, Eastman Road mm -hmm. that's parked there that is registered. It's registered. And if uh, you have no recourse except if somebody complains, that, and then... Just line of sight, any of those issues? There's still no recourse. I mean, if there's a line of sight issue, a dangerous issue, there is, but mm -hmm. it's not necessarily for a driveway, because if it's legally parked away from a driveway, mm -hmm. that poor person has a problem that we legally can't address. Say it's a cargo van. Mm -hmm. We couldn't address that. And now, if, if this is passed, we could. Okay. And we've had that same instance with a cargo van. We've asked, asked nicely to please don't do that because your neighbor can't see out. And um, being nice about it, they've said no. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Uh, other questions? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, at this point, then, I will declare the uh, public hearing on the proposed amendments to the traffic ordinance to be open. So any, uh, I will uh, quickly run down through the public hearing rules. Uh, are there people who would like to speak to this? Just, okay. Uh, before we uh, do commence with the hearing itself, I'd just like to quickly review some of the rules and guidelines of public hearing. Uh, citizens wishing to speak will come to the lectern and clearly give their names and addresses, or if not, uh, their affiliation, which brings, it, brings with it cause for them to speak. Citizens should speak only to the issue at hand. Uh, remarks should be limited to three minutes per speaker. Remarks should be addressed to and through the chair. Uh, there will be no personal attacks in your comments. Uh, this includes attacks on town employees, elected officials, or anyone else. Uh, there will be no overt displays of pleasure or displeasure in the audience, as this can often be intimidating to those others who may wish to speak. Uh, 
Um, so I thank you in advance for abiding by those uh, rules. So I would now ask you to come forward uh, to the lectern. You can queue up two or three deep so that we can move things along as quickly as possible. Please approach the lectern. Hello. My name is Sandy Ferris, and I'm at 21 Cottage Lane with the nursery school. Um, the only question I have from the map that I received presently right now as you go down Cottage Lane, at, at where it goes down into Guided Circle and Maiden Cove Lane, there's presently no parking where the street narrows from like 50 feet, whatever it is, down to 30. Um, in front of what was Mrs. Doby's house that's recently been sold. There's a no parking sign there that goes forward. Is that the 60 feet you're speaking of? Because it's not marked on the map that we have, which would be on the left side of the street. The, go ahead, yeah. The, the 60 feet is measured from Kai's Lane, and, and as the chief Please. said, it's to try to enable the person who built the little cutout to still be able to park there. I'm speaking the other side of Cottage Lane. The other side of Cottage Lane, there is, as on, you... At the top of the hill. At the top of the hill. Where Maiden Cove Lane goes down. Goes down the hill and And then to Cottage the Lane makes that turn and then goes down the hill. Where that turn is, and Mrs. Doby's house, and our, you know, I'm here and, and Mrs. Yeah. Doby's here, from, I guess, her property line yeah. to the top of Maiden Cove Lane. Presently now, there are no parking signs, or there's a no parking sign and then no parking here to the corner, where it really narrows down so that if anyone is parked there, you cannot get a vehicle through. But in the map that you sent us, there's nothing here stating that that also is going to stay no parking. Yeah, that, that area was never no parking. Those signs were not placed by the town. Oh, is that right? My question then to you is, the street narrows down, really narrow there, and if there are any, excuse me, if there are any cars parked from that nearing space to where it turns, you can't get through. I know that cars will go up over my yard, and then the telephone pole is there, which stops them, but if there's anything parked there, you can't get through. So oh, my energy. question is, should there all, at that point, be a no parking side on that side? We, we, we looked at that, ma'am, and there's also, there are provisions in the ordinance to say there's no parking within so many feet of a driveway. And in that area on the left, there's a couple of driveways that are pretty close to each other, and that seemed to take care of the situation without keep adding an abundance of signs. One, one thing we find is when we, we do no parking regulations and we put up a ton of signs, there's a backlash from the neighborhood. Uh, so we're trying to avoid a whole lot of signs, but if we do see an issue, we still have the right to put the emergency no parking signs in there. But we think the ordinance takes care of it by no parking within so many feet of a driveway. Because we can't get out of our driveway and down the street when cars are parked there. Yeah. We, we believe that the current regulations will take care of that problem without simply because of the proximity of the driveways to each other. Okay. I know that's not working, and I know I've requested as best I can to um, respect the neighborhood and the parking, but when someone wants to park somewhere, it makes no difference what the sign says they're going to park there. So I'm hoping that we get some ticketing going on to uh, help alleviate that problem. But I just, from the map that I had, it was not clear to me. And I was under the understanding because there are no parking signs there. There's a no parking sign and no parking to the corner. And yet in the map when you sent it out, there was nothing there. So that's what I wanted to clarify because I can see that as a, a problem. There's also in the ordinance no parking within so many feet of an intersection too. So you add all those things in and it, it, okay. we believe we would have the ability to, to control that situation that you're talking about. Okay. Thank you, Sandy. If you could queue up, if you plan to speak, uh, if you could queue up two or three deep uh, at the lectern, it will help speed things up. Thank you. Hi, I'm Terry Patterson. I live at 15 Surf Road. Um, I have two concerns that are of particular importance to me. Um, I have two young children, um, 
and there are two young children that live across the street from me now. There are four kids that are moving into the Dobie house. There are at least three other kids on Cottage Farms Road. And with the parking through there, it's very dangerous. We all, you know, we all know that a lot of people use Casino Beach that don't have access to Casino Beach. Um, there are cars parked there all the time. Um, it's very dangerous for us that have access to Casino Beach to actually get to Casino Beach. You know, it's not more than 10 houses away. But with all the traffic and all the parking issues, there's limited visibility. And the kids, kids are kids. You know, they, I can hold their hands and we can walk slowly, but cars do come around there to park. And it's a lot of traffic for a very small area. Um, secondly, my concern is that if we limit, if we do reduce the parking here, which I am an advocate for, um, I'm afraid it's going to spill over to Surf Road. Um, there are no no parking signs there. The way it looks on the map to me, um, you can park on Surf Road on both sides. Um, most of you probably know that Surf Road is about half the width of Cottage Road. With one car parked on Surf Road, you can barely get by unless it's kind of parked off the, as far off the road as you can possibly get. So right now, there's there's no parking on or there is parking on both sides of Surf Road, which was which is not even realistic whatsoever. So I think if you limit the parking there, I think you're going to it's going to spill over onto Surf Road because people are still going to access that beach by car. So I encourage us to look at the parking on Surf Road as well. Um, there are a lot of young, young kids over there, and um, there's, the traffic is fast. Um, there's no restrictions on the speed. Um, my understanding is the speed limit's inappropriate as it is as such, but cars come down there 20, 25 miles an hour, and it's a very, very thin, narrow road with lots of kids. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next. My name is Jane Reynolds and I own 16 Surf Road and I share the concern that was just expressed when I received this uh, diagram. It does seem to indicate that in attempting to correct existing problems with the traffic to Casino Beach along Cottage Lane, and to alleviate congestion around the school and the lower area of the neighborhood that I think it potentially uh, makes a huge impact on Surf Road. Now, I'm one of the most recent arrivals to the neighborhood in terms of ownership there, but I have observed many families walking with dogs and children to and fro from the park through our neighborhood down to the beach. and. It's quite difficult at times for people to work around the cars, to have a UPS truck arrive, another car heading back out to Shore Road. It's very difficult at best. And certainly the width of surf is less than, which was already previously addressed, than Cottage Lane or some of the other areas. And I fail to understand why in our attempt to revamp an entire existing problem we wouldn't look at reducing the amount of parking on surf. If that means that there's more foot traffic and less vehicle traffic, um, then I think that that's a good thing. Certainly many people come from other locations and walk down with their children, with their dogs, with their friends, uh, and I really do think it's a serious problem to have parking on both sides of lower surf. I think we're going to have, and then the residents at the, closer to the water that are resident only parking, where are their guests going to park? Where are the people making deliveries they're going to go? I think we're going to have much more of a bottleneck than we even potentially could foresee. So I'm concerned with the proposal in that regard. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. Hi, I'm Mandy Garmy, and I live at One Garden Lane. And um, first I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for addressing this. This has been a concern for those of us down in that cul-de-sac for years, and it's been a hard problem to address, and I really appreciate your efforts, and I kind of like the proposal myself, but I understand that perhaps it may need to be uh, broadened a bit for the folks on Surf Road. I have one question about the enforcement. Um, in terms of identifying or knowing who are residents um, for the purposes of enforcing this. And, um, I'll pass that question 
on to the chief. Uh, he's in charge of our enforcement. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Sorry, I was just making some notes back there. Um, as far as uh, knowing who the residents are, um, should an officer go through there or should we uh, receive a call of uh, problem parkers down in that particular area? We now have laptops in the cars where we can run all the registrations. Um, should we tag somebody inappropriately? We have an appeals process. We might not know that that was your car. It could be registered to a company or um, your business and we have an appeals process or a phone call, uh, we'll take care of that. And um, we have a way to find out who, who lives on that road and whatnot. But uh, should we make a mistake, which we would, some, we will at some point tag your vehicle. We have an appeals process and I don't think you have to go through too far in the appeals process to get that taken care of. Um, if I could, could I address the surf road issue, or um, would you not like to this time? Um, That's what I was just going to ask. Him. Why don't we save that uh, sure. until we consider the issue? Certainly. Uh, thanks, Chief. Uh, Hi, my name is Mylon Cohen. I live at 21 Surf Road, and I would like to thank the Chief very much for uh, an excellent presentation for considering this, and I'd like to thank the Town Council for... Uh, considering this change. Uh, I think in, in the, uh, the name of public safety that these types of changes are, are very worthwhile and, and, and needed. Uh, I do think that, that there's the possibility of some unintentioned consequences of this on Surf Road, but to keep to the rules uh, for the proposal at hand, I would say that this is an important first step. I fully support these changes and that uh, it may be necessary in the future to address other issues uh, and I am hopeful that at that time if they become issues that we would be able to address them at that time but uh, I think the proposal that has put forth here is an important uh, change to the ordinance that will make this area of our town much safer. Thank you. Thanks Marlon. Anyone else would like to speak to this issue? Going once, twice, Seeing none, uh, we will close the public hearing. And now uh, we will go to item number 149-2009, uh, consideration of the traffic ordinance. We've had a pretty good setup, but I know the chief wanted to make some additions to his comments. So why don't you step to the mic? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just wanted to address this surf road issue. And um, that is a possibility that that could happen. However, um, I think Mike uh, touched upon it, but uh, the doctor also uh, touched upon it, that uh, we like to take things slow and easy. We just don't want to come into an area and just put the signs up and that's the way it is. Um, yes, we might have a learning curve here and we might have to look at next summer should we have a problem on Surf Road, but I don't think the residents would, the majority of the residents, and I might be wrong, of uh, the police department of the town coming in and posting no parking one side on Surf Road from Shore Road all the way down. As of yet, because I couldn't necessarily say we're going to have a problem. We may have a problem. If we have a problem, we'll have to address that at another time. But um, we like to move in slow steps to try to, my, my real focus here was to get, get the emergency traffic down to Garden Circle, Garden Lane area. Thanks, Chief. Uh, David? Uh, I, I just want to come back to the issue that Penny had raised a little while ago. When we discussed Section 13-2-2L, which we're proposing we delete the uh, prohibition against parking on a street when it is practicable, practicable to park elsewhere, I thought the rationale was that that would then prohibit parking on Surf Road or any road when there's a driveway nearby that the car could actually be parked on. And that didn't make a whole lot of sense. Or if my children were playing basketball in my driveway and I parked the car out on the road, the police would come by and say, hey, it's practicable to park your car in your driveway, so get it off the road. Um, so that, I understood that was the rationale. but. 
Now, as I think this through, we really do want to encourage people to put their cars on their driveways as opposed to on the street. So uh, although I understood the rationale sitting in the Ordinance Committee discussing it with you sitting here tonight, I'm thinking, hmm, you know, are we now essentially allowing cars to be parked on the roads all the time? And that, to me, doesn't seem like a good idea. So Here, Here's my viewpoint on that. Sure. I just give you my viewpoint is that normally we would not have a call on something like, you know, this whole area down here has got cars parked on the road. Could you do something about it? It's usually my neighbor has a car parked on the road. Um, for instance, if we could, if, if everybody's familiar with Elizabeth Park, if I went down there and got a call on um, my, uh, on person A's neighbor saying, look it, I don't like their car on the road, you would then have to say, look it, I can't just take care of person A's car or person B's car. I've got to go down through the whole area and tell everybody you can't park on the street. When in fact, this, the, the street's very wide down there and there's no reason why they can't from December 1 to April 1. Um, I just don't think that that's user friendly myself, my opinion. The, the, the other side of it is, you know, one of the, the uh, citizens mentioned, you know, the, the concern with speeding. You know, for example, Surf Road, you really want one vehicle about two houses down on one side and another vehicle three houses down on the other side because what that does, it slows the vehicles from making it a, a, a real speedway. And, you know, what we've found is the best traffic calming device on a street is, is the natural parking of cars spread out in, in Surf Road. 98% of the time, that is what you see there is a couple of cars which, which does help to slow traffic. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Okay, thanks. Um, Sarah, would you like to get a motion on the floor for us to consider and then we can have further? Do you want to bunch this all together? Or uh, yeah, I would say a, a general motion with regard to the traffic ordinance and then we can discuss if people have problems with specific. Okay, so I propose a motion that we adopt the um, changes to the parking ordinance as set before us in our packet. Second. Moved and seconded. Now we'll have discussion on the motion. I have a couple of things. Any? Number one, I understand what uh, Chief Williams uh, meant when he was talking about taking things in, in incremental steps. Uh, but I really, I really think that we should work to have some resolution for what the people of Surf Road have brought forward. Um, and I, I don't have any proposal for what that resolution might be, whether it be parking on one side of the street, because I would need to think through this process to see what the ripple effect would be. But I think it makes sense to kind of uh, step back and look at what is, what's the ripple effect happening. And number two, I really get uneasy about um, cars being parked on streets for extended periods of time because you're going to run into the same issue that you've run into with the why you've got the trailers and the trucks. Um, and so I have a concern about those two elements within the ordinance. Yeah. I, have, I have a question for the chief. Um, and my question is that second problem that Penny was talking about do we see that much? I mean, is, are there cars that sit on, parked on the street for extended periods of time? No. Drive down Fowler Road, and I can name three or four houses where there are cars parked. I, I, it happens, and I, um, and I know that it happens on other streets that there are cars parked, because you can they're always there. So I just have this concern about cars being parked for extended periods of time. And, and I understand what Michael's saying about traffic calming and things like that. Um, um, but 
is that the solution to surf roads problem is to allow cars to be parked in order to slow the traffic down. I, I really have a concern about cars. There's two parking. different issues, uh, Penny. When I, when I, I, when I answered Ann, no, we, we have not got complaints. Follow road, I've never heard of a complaint of somebody parked on follow road for an extended period of time. Thanks, Ann. That was my follow-up question for the chief, because I understand, I understand your concern, but I'm also, I'm also hesitant to legislate about things that people aren't even complaining about, and that's my next question was going to be, do we get complaints? Um, when you answered no, I presume that's because you just aren't hearing complaints about it. So no. it's been my observation that people in town are not hesitant to complain <laughs> <laughs> if, if something's bothering them, and, and, I, and that's great. But people let you know what's on their mind. And I like to hear their concerns, and that's one of the concerns is the surf road, road issue. But I have not really gotten any, any calls on any vehicles parked on the road for an extended period of time. I haven't. Uh, I saw Sarah and then David. Just a quick question. Neil, if somebody did call and complain, if we make this change in the ordinance, are you then able to do nothing about that? Do you have any, can you, I mean, other than going and saying, can you please get your car off the road? That's, that's correct. So is that going to be a little bit of a problem for you? Because basically now you can't do anything. I don't, I don't get the calls. I, I haven't, it's just like moving in, in incremental steps with uh, maybe parking on Surf Road. I, I don't have the problem. I don't, I, Probably 99% of the people yeah. would move it if yeah. you asked. Most of, our, most of our calls with something parked is a utility trailer or a boat trailer. David? You know, as we've talked this throughout, I am comfortable with the proposed change. I just was trying to flesh the issue out a little bit more. And, and frankly, when I look at the road I live on, which is, can be a drag race sometimes at night, Hunts Point Road, maybe we benefit from a few cars parked on the, on the, along the road. So uh, I'm comfortable with this. If it turns out we have a, the unintended consequence of the entire town parking on their road, we can always revisit it as well. I guess I feel the same way about Surf Road. I, I feel like it's an incremental step in the right direction, and we should maybe enact it. And then, you know, if it continues to be a problem come next summer, is, would it not be easy to go a little bit further with it? I think it would be, and in fairness to the residents, um, I, I don't know if they, they speak to it, but I just would not want to arbitrarily go right now and say, okay, the northerly side of Surf Road, we're posting it. Because Believe it or not, on Cottage Lane, I've had residents call me up and say, isn't it time we switched it to the other side of the road? <laughs> and, and in fairness to them, I understand that. But, you know, we just don't want to be changing things like that all the time because they're, they're I, I mean, I, I would like the residents of Surf Road to, to at least think about that for a while before they wanted that. And, and, and let's experience some problems. I actually think the shift will be more towards Shore Road than it will be Surf Road. That's just an opinion. Thanks, Chief. Other discussion? David? I just want to comment and thank the Chief. I mean, I think what we're witnessing here is a pretty remarkable display of the way our town staff is responsive to the needs of neighborhoods um, and citizens generally. We're not hearing a chief come in saying, I want to over-regulate the town and keep people off the streets and by God, somebody parks where they're not supposed to, we're going to haul them away. <laughs> to the contrary. I mean, it's the other extreme. It's, well, you know, we'll call somebody and ask them to do the right thing if we need to. And, they won't, then we'll come back to the council, we'll sort of revisit it in increments. And it's, again, one of the great attributes of living in Cape Elizabeth. So I thank think you, it's council. been a remarkable presentation, so thank you. Other discussion? If not, uh, Sarah, would you please repeat the, the motion? And then. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had we, we had a we had a no, I we had a suggestion from a citizen that if we if we have a motion and then we have considerable discussion going on that we repeat the motion. And I think it's probably a good idea. So sure. I'm going to ask that you, if you can remember. I move <laughs> to adopt the changes to the parking ordinance as set forth in our packet. 
Thank you very much. Uh, all in favor of the motion? Was, don't we need a second? It was, was seconded. There a second? It was second. It's already in second. I just wanted to repeat the reading of the motion. So That's all in favor of the motion? Unanimous, 7-0. Thank you. Uh, item number 143-2009, uh, Conservation Land Near Leighton Farm Subdivision. Uh, this was tabled from our October 14, 2009 meeting. Um, a citizen is asking the town council to change a decision by the town manager regarding the use of municipal property near <coughs> Leighton Farms Road. And I have asked the, uh, the town manager to please set this up for us. I'll, uh, I'll, could I ask that the, uh, the citizens who are leaving to please do so as quickly as possible? Thank you, I think. Uh, Mike, would you set this up for us and then? Uh, yes, I'd be happy to. Yes, early in the month of May, uh, the town was approached by some residents in the Leighton Farms area uh, about some desire to, to do some uh, improvements uh, on the town-owned property uh, that's, that was deeded to the town in 2003. Uh, members of the Conservation Commission met with those property owners, informed them uh, of some of the restrictions that, that are involved. But at the same time, uh, there was an issue involving someone who had a, a planter that needed to be, re be removed. And that, the, the planter, the, the resident re, uh, lo, removed the planter so that it was solely on their own property. The, just, as you look up Leighton Farms Road, just above where that planter is, and uh, just in, before you get to the O'Hearn property, uh, the town owns uh, in fee a, a third part, part of a much larger parcel, uh, which you have, which you can see here on the map, uh, but we own, uh, about a 30-foot wide parcel that there's a green belt sign there. And when Wiley Enterprises LLC deeded that land to the, to the town in 2003, the deed uh, provides that no buildings, utilities, or other significant improvements shall be erected, used, maintained, or be allowed to stand on the property except boardwalk steps and signs approved for marking by the Cape Elizabeth Greenbelt. Uh, the deed also requires the preservation of natural vegetative growth, and I quote, the natural tree and shrub growth on the property shall be preserved in its existing condition, except as may be necessary for the construction and maintenance of past walkways or the removal of dead or diseased trees and vegetations. And when, when we looked at it, uh, what we found was that there was a stone wall, a part of which was built on the town-owned property, and it was also, there had been some shrubberies and trees that had just been planted on the town-owned property, as well as a full residential-style lawn. Uh, we've had a number of issues over the years on different uh, adjacent to town-owned land where there have been what we would call incursions onto the town-owned property. For instance, back when the middle school was being renovated uh, in the uh, early 1990s, it was discovered that along uh, Farm Hill Road, there were a number of folks that had built sheds and other things on town-owned property, and the town council took the position at that time that, that any structure needed to be back, moved back onto the private property, that we did not want to be responsible in any way for any of that structure, and that the town needed to, uh, to follow you know, its responsibilities as stewards of its own property. You know, this is, uh, you know, within the right-of-way, we allow things by sufferance. We allow mailboxes, we allow plantings, that sort of thing. But there's, there's a different standard on town-owned property, and particularly when there's a deed that specifically says, you know, I'm giving you this land, and you have to follow it for its intended purposes. And we did receive a letter uh, from the town attorney uh, on this particular issue, and Tom Leahy wrote uh, to, to me, back on August 20th, uh, the town accepted title to this property with clear restrictions and has a duty arising from acceptance of such title with restrictions not to violate such restrictions 
or to knowingly allow others to violate these restrictions. It would clearly be bad precedent to allow encroachments onto the town property accepted with conservation green belt type restrictions on a case by case basis. Again, quoting Tom Lake, I feel the town has a duty holding title to property subject to non disturbance restrictions to both the party who made the transfer and to those to be benefited thereby to take action to present, prevent violation. It would create a bad precedent otherwise as to the other past or future similar conveyances if the town were to selectively decide on a case-by-case -case basis which violations to prevent and which to ignore. Further, the town subdivision ordinance mandates that a developer donate open space land or pay an impact fee. Uh, it would be inappropriate for the town to take title to open space parcels to fulfill this requirement on subdivision developers, but then not enforce the open space conservation restrictions. I would, and then he recommended that we have a survey. survey. The, we also heard from the Conservation Commission on September 30th, uh, and they voted five to nothing to recommend to the town council that the boundary separating town open space from the O'Hearn property be clearly marked and that appropriate action be taken to eliminate the encroachment and restore the developed areas to its natural state in accordance with the limitations imposed by the open space deed. The Conservation Commission has serious concerns about the precedent set in tolerating encroachments onto open space in violation of the deed restrictions. And then they summarize the concerns below. They support the uniform treatment of abutters to open space. Uh, they worry that, uh, is concerned about the willingness of property owners to donate land to the town as open space if the property owner is unsure that the town will ultimately honor the open space restrictions. Uh, and they also believe that if the town does not preserve its open space boundaries, the commission believes that the encroachments will continue to occur and ultimately jeopardize the connectivity of the Green Belt Trail system. What the issue, and you, we have a, the open space map there. You know, the town owns a considerable amount of open space. It, it is difficult to monitor. Uh, and, you know, and there are some restrictions, there are some incursions from time to time. When we, we have a provision that says you can't, that it has to be kept in its natural space, and we're allowing someone to plant new trees and new shrubbery, which is what happened in this instance, and when a stone wall was just built in the last couple of years uh, onto the municipal property, and when it is being mowed so as to look like it's connected to the lot next door, that is a real discouragement from folks from using that, particularly if they don't live as an immediate abutter. You know, the Greenbelt trail system is open to all citizens. It's not just open to the, the folks of immediate neighborhood. And a lot of folks feel uncomfortable walking over what looks like someone else's lawn. I, I know we, we see it from time to time, you know, people do it, but generally people don't like to trespass on, on one of those folks' lawns. So for all those reasons, I wrote to uh, the O'Hearns on May 26th. Uh, I heard back from rather quickly, they were quite unhappy. Uh, what I asked them to do was to uh, move what they had planted back onto their own property, to remove the stone wall part that was on the property, and to, to stop, uh, to cease mowing the lawn. Uh, after the initial call, I heard there didn't seem to be any action. I heard nothing. I wrote again on August 25th, and following that, I, I heard from Mr. O'Hearn again saying, you know, what right of appeal is there? I want to appeal this. And I explained that, you know, my writing to the O'Hearns was as, as sort of as the representative of the property owner, not as the town manager. This isn't a regulatory issue. It just happens that the town owns this property. You know, it could be anyone that owns this property, and I think anyone who owns property needs to ask themselves, and the town does own this property, you know, to what level do you let someone else, not under your direction, build a structure on your property, to what level do you let someone take, you know, what's supposed to be natural and maintain a lawn on it when it is in fact not their property, they just have to be next to it. And, and you know, those essentially are, are, are the issues we're dealing with, I believe, in this instance. Anyway, Mr. O'Hearn uh, asked to appeal the decision to the Town Council. He has done so, uh, and he's here this evening for that purpose. Thank you. Uh, this is an item that was tabled on October 14th, uh, so I would like to entertain a motion to take it off the table. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, okay. Uh, Phil, the floor is yours. 
Shall we need vote to, on the motion? We need to vote. Yes, let's vote on the motion. <laughs> All in favor of taking the item off the table. Unanimous. Thank you. Phil. Well, I want to thank the council for taking the time to hear this issue, and I very much appreciate Dave and all of you folks for serving over the last few years. Um, I'd like to uh, I put together a little visual, because I'm, I'm a visual person. And I, have to, I think I did send these to everybody. I tried to reach out to a lot of you folks today to try to frame this, and thanks, Mike, for framing you know, what we've talked about to this point. Um, what I'm here to present is, I believe that this is a little bit of a special case, not because it's my lot, but because if we look at the history of this subdivision, and I want to just give you a little bit of a history lesson, if you will, so that uh, I think everybody can understand where how this happened. First of all, I want to say that I recognize that the wall is on the town property, and in fact, I have been mowing that lawn and it wasn't because I was doing it to uh, you know, defy the town. Until Mike brought this to my attention in May, I was not aware that, you know, I realized that some of that is the town property. But when you look at my lot here, um, you'd almost think that that is my front lawn. Um, I put a picture in here of the house when it was being built because this wall was built prior to us taking the occupancy of the home. And the reason the wall was put in, obviously, it serves an aesthetic reason. But more importantly, any of you that are familiar with the Leighton Farm subdivision, it's very high from the top of the street to the bottom. And most of the homes in that neighborhood have a stone wall that's been erected to hold back the soils. Um, so the wall was erected in November of 2004. We, as, a, as you can see, were, were given an occupancy permit through the developer, Joel Fitzpatrick, in January of 05, uh, and this issue has never been brought to my attention until now. Um, and to speak about the open land, uh, Mike, because it, it's a good point, this property, I, I did not install this lawn. The, the developer installed the lawn at my home um, because that was part of the, the building package, if you will. And um, so I have just maintained it, just as you would maintain the, the grass in front of the property. As you can see, that's how the house looks now. I think most of the neighbors that live in the neighborhood are here tonight, and we've talked about this. Uh, everybody uses this uh, walkway that connects the Leighton Farm subdivision to Cross Hill. Uh, it, there was never any intention on our part from preventing people or making people think that this was our lawn, and we were trying to stop people from going through there. Quite the contrary, it actually has become quite a nice walkway for people in both neighborhoods uh, day, on a daily basis, children ride their bicycles and walk through there to get to the school bus stop at the end of Wells, at the end of uh, Lake Farm Road on Wells Road, because they think it's much easier to access that than walking all the way down through that windy cross hill entryway. Um, so it makes a lot of sense to maintain this property the way it is, because otherwise you'd have high grass and ticks. But the real point is that this was the way it was delivered to me when we when we actually moved in. We, we did, in fact, put the plantings in, but that was part of the wall structure. The, the main thing I want to point out as far as the subdivision, is a plan of the subdivision in here, and uh, it's, I apologize, it's a small uh, depiction, but the green space that was left here, I think, was primarily to allow the cluster zoning that was approved by the planning board back in 03. And, um, in fact, you can see I don't, from the, I, had, I highlighted the uh, original subdivision plan, there is an entryway to this green space from Wells Road, but nobody uses that because it's so overgrown with bittersweet and every other thing that's grown in there. And really, the only way that most people utilize this is through that space. Um, so I, I would just say that, you know, the green, the, the open space, but the, the one thing I wanted to point out is that if you look at my lot, um, most of all, every lot in this subdivision had at least a 15-foot setback, except for lot 5, which is the one that we purchased. That has a 5-foot setback, and the reason that is is because the developer was allowed to use that 30-foot uh, right-of-way, or green space, if you will, in his calculation, because all the houses have to be 50 feet apart. So, and I've talked to Joel about this. Joel is agreeing with me that he feels that, you know, this is the character that he wanted 
if you drive up that street, um, it, it looks like a normal, you know, residential subdivision that's been clustered with all the houses very close. I think in reality, you probably could have eliminated one of the lots here, and it would have eliminated this problem. But that's not what we're dealing with now. And um, so what I'm asking for is, uh, you know, actually for the town to take no action, to be able to leave the wall there because it serves as a retaining wall. And I think everybody in this room that utilizes that walkway would like it to be maintained the way it is. Thank you, Phil. Um, before you, yeah. Is it possible that uh, uh, Brian Raybeck might be able to speak for a minute just to speak to some of the legal issues that? Okay, if we uh, keep things moving, mind, even fairly brief, sure. Good evening. Thank you very much. I, uh, my name is Brian Rayback. I live at 5 Layton Farm Road. Uh, that's the lot that is just across the street and down the hill one from the O'Hearns parcel. Um, and let me be clear, I'm, I'm here to, entirely on my own behalf. I don't represent anybody tonight. I'm not here on behalf of the O'Hearns. Um, what brings me here tonight, and I think this is a concern that other neighbors on the street have, and by the way, I was counting noses. I think there are five other households represented here tonight in addition to myself and in addition to the O'Hearns, which is pretty good on a street of about 12 or 13 houses. My primary concern is ensuring that we maintain easy and open access uh, over this land. We call it the cut through in my household because we use it all the time to cut through the steeple bush um, and we're not the only ones. It's used regularly by, uh, we see runners who like to run Leighton Farm Hill because it's one of the only hills in town, so they want to get their hill work in. And you see them run up, and they do the circle, they come part way down, and then they shoot through the steeple bush to connect with, with the rest of Cross Hill. Um, on Halloween night, dozens of kids go back and forth between the neighborhoods. Um, and we did this the other night. In fact, yesterday I was on that cut through with my daughter, who's four. Uh, she's learning to ride a bike. She's not particularly good at it yet. I don't really want her on Wells Road on a bike. That's not a pedestrian friendly road. So my primary concern is there. Um, this connectivity, the way it is now, the way it's maintained now, it works exactly like town planners draw these things up. I have to believe that this is what the planning board was thinking of. It provides interconnectivity, pedestrian interconnectivity, uh, between neighborhoods. What I'm worried about is what happens if the O'Hearns are not allowed to maintain that cut through. Um, if it's not regularly mowed, if you just let it go, uh, what does it become? Eventually it's some kind of meadow, and if you project far enough into the future, you start getting trees and it grows up into a forest. That's what happens to the land around here. Uh, if that happens, this cut-through becomes impassable, frankly, and we lose the point of the area, of the cut-through, which is passive recreation and neighborhood connectivity. It's going to be full of brush, and as Phil mentioned, full of ticks, you're not going to be able to push a stroller through there. You won't want to walk your dog through there. So if the O'Hearns aren't allowed to maintain the area, who will? Uh, and I think the default here is the town. Um, now the example that I'm most familiar with uh, is the one that is in the O'Hearns and other people's backyards on that side of the street. There's a Greenbelt Trail, or there's supposed to be one, right behind the west side, the, on the homes on the west side of Leighton Farm, uh, have a greenbelt trail behind them, but there's no trail there. There's never been a trail there, to my knowledge. Maybe there was when it was first developed, but it's never been maintained, uh, and it's completely impassable. When we moved in, I thought that was going to be great. I was going to ride my mountain bike up and down that trail, um, and I thought particularly going downhill would be a lot of fun from the power lines in the back of the subdivision, but it can't be done. Um, on the subdivision plan, I will just note, that is supposed to be a path. It's not just open space, okay? It's not just an environmental or a buffer kind of situation. There's supposed to be a path there, and it hasn't happened. Uh, and we, that subdivision has been in place for a little while, so that's one of the difficulties. Um, now, when I look at the deed, I don't think it's quite so cut and dried as to what can and cannot be done. You can't take provisions, singular provisions out of a deed out of context. You need to read the whole thing and balance them. 
On the one hand, there's very clear intent that we're supposed to be able to use this for passive recreation. If we let it grow up and really be its natural state, that's not a walking trail. That's not something anybody wants to ride their bike on. At the same time, these activities are supposed to be limited to ensure they're consistent with the natural beauty of the area. That's another phrase that comes out of the deed. Uh, and they're not supposed to interfere with the residential nature of the neighborhood. Likewise, the existing vegetation is to be preserved, except insofar as needed to keep the cut through open uh, for passive recreational activities. Uh, and on this point, by the way, I, I do question, um, it talks about preserving the vegetation in its existing condition. This whole area was dug up for a sewer line. And as Phil said, my understanding from talking with Joel, the builder of the, the developer of the subdivision, is that uh, it, the existing vegetation is what's there now. Um, so if you drew up sort of a Venn diagram of all the interests that are represented by this catch-all kind of deed, and you were looking at oh, residential character, um, passive recreation, uh, you know, maintaining the natural beauty, maintaining existing, veg existing vegetation, you wouldn't have a perfect circle. These things would be overlapping with each other in various ways. So what that leads me to is that I think there's room for a practical solution here. Um, the town has very legitimate interests, there's no question about it, in carrying out the duties that it has under the deed. Um, the town would be in a bad spot if, if you took uh, obligations on when you took these deeds and then we simply didn't do anything about them. I don't think that's a good idea. At the same time, I think the neighborhood has legitimate interests in that, you know, we all relied on this cut through um, when we moved in. We thought we would be able to use it. We thought our kids would be able to use it. So I've got to believe there's a solution uh, that we can reach. And, and here I'll apologize because I think we as neighbors, and I'll, again, I'll just speak for myself, we're coming late to this conversation. And I apologize for that. That's our fault. Um, but I've got to believe that there's something we can do that works for everybody. Uh, to the extent, for example, that the town feels it has some liability. Uh, you know, for example, Wiley Enterprises, which is, you probably know is Joe Fitzpatrick's entity, um, it's the only one with, with enforcement rights. Uh, I'm just guessing, I haven't spoken to him, but I suspect we could get him to come to the table. He might be willing to release some of those rights. Um, if we needed to do a boundary line adjustment, I would think we could manage that. Um, you know, more importantly, from my perspective, why don't we set up a management plan? How is this area going to be managed? Maybe, maybe we allow the O'Hearns to mow it, but you can't fertilize it, you can't use pesticide. Um, you know, maybe there are things that we can do that's sort of a reasonable accommodation. So in sum, I'm just, I'm not in the all or nothing camp here. We were talking earlier about incremental change, trying to do things uh, in sort of a community way so that everybody is protected. If we can play a role in that, I'd like to, to be able to do that. I'd like to volunteer to do that um, if, if it's not too late, if we're not beyond the past the point of that. Uh, uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mike has asked for yeah, one minute. Just, just very briefly. The town works cooperatively with neighbors on the green belt throughout the community. It's not a, at all unusual. However, the control remains with the property owner of the town. And I think that's, that's the distinction here, uh, is that, you know, the town has asked someone not to do something, and they're doing it with, with no approach of a compromise except to appeal to the council. Uh, you know, I, the, the town's interest is, is maintaining paths. In fact, what the, you know, it's, I, I think, uh, as uh, Mr. Rayback just spoke, the natural tree and shrub growth in this property shall preserve in its existing condition, except as may be necessary for the construction and maintenance of paths walkways. I think that the town has the same interests as all of the property owners. It's just that, you know, we believe, the Conservation Commission, myself, and the town attorney, one, that we have a responsibility to maintain the way we interpret this. Uh, and as the property owner, we have standing in doing that. Uh, and secondly, uh, that, that, we have, that we have a responsibility to do so. But, you know, we're, we're happy to work with the neighbors. Uh, we're happy to, you know, have a shared, you know, if, if they want to assist with the maintenance, that, that would be, would welcome that. But we just don't want to be in a situation where, you know, the town says, as the property owner, this is the way it is. And nothing happens, which is what happened for three months 
before I wrote again, and there didn't seem to be a whole lot of cooperation. But we'd be happy to work with the neighbors, provided it's understood that we need to maintain the restrictions uh, that are in the ordinance, that are in the deed. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Ann and then David. I, I have a question for Mike, since Maureen, I don't think, I don't think Maureen's here. Um, when the Conservation Commission and the, and, or the town maintains a trail um, in town on the Greenbelt Trail, what sort of maintenance is allowed? In other words, I, I know we don't, you know, mm. they don't cut down a highway, an eight-foot wide highway, but I'm trying to sort of figure out what was allowed for a pathway. It, it depends on the language and the deed of conveyance. Okay. In this particular instance, it's, we keep it natural in its existing condition, which, you know, it, there was a sewer line that went through there, except as may be necessary for the construction and maintenance of past walkways. You know, I have spoken to Joel Fitzpatrick, you know, around noontime today, about this, he's uh, had an extensive conversation with him. You know, he, he has another development, not under this limited li liability corporation, but another, where he has offered us or giving us deeds to five different parcels with this exact same language. Uh, you know, so to, you know, he, he indicated that, he's, that this language has worked. It's the typical language in conservation deeds, and he He's very comfortable with this, although you know he, he again he you know sold property to these these individuals, and he would hope that the town would be cooperative with them, but you know I I it's within the context of still dealing with the routine practices, which are we work with the conservation commission to develop priorities of paths. We try to recruit volunteers from the neighborhoods to do it, and we've had some particularly folks in Cross Hill have been very helpful. Uh, folks around the Stonegate area have been very helpful in working with us to maintain trails. I guess my question is, it, maintaining a trail is, is different than just letting it all just completely grow up. That's correct. Correct? Okay. Last I knew. Yes. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure. <coughs> thank you. David? Uh, Mike, I was just, uh, I want to focus on the stone wall a little bit here. Um, it, it looks to me like that went up fairly early on in the construction process and I have been on that road before and it you know it's obviously a hill so there may be some benefit uh, to the property and neighboring properties that such a wall exists I don't know I'm not an expert but um, has the town ever been in the situation where it would consider selling a sliver of property to accommodate that sort of encroachment the town has never sold conservation land for any purpose. Okay, and my next question is if, because I understand the concern with the donor, you don't want to discourage donors from donating property only to have the town turn around and sell it, but here where the donor was a developer of this project, might take a look at this and say, yeah, I get it. Um, I would not be opposed to that. Would that alter the town's approach? I can't speak for the developer, but I think it's a very slippery slope when the town accepts conservation easements to go back to the developers to try to weaken those provisions. And I, if you reread the Conservation Commission letter, uh, that's also within the same spirit. I think that the council would make a long-term strategic mistake in, in taking any action that would not maintain the integrity of, of an easement and to do so as a matter of a, of a public pronouncement. Uh, you know, which, which is, you know, not to say that, you know, there are other areas where there are slight incursions and we don't deal with them all the time. What the real issue comes up, and we deal with it all the time, is someone sells a piece of property. They have a surveyor come in and does a property. They're trying to get a mortgage. Suddenly they're told they can't get the mortgage because they don't have right title and interest to the improvements on the, the, the property. And this happens time and time again, where people come to us in a panic. They have a closing next week, they can't do it, and they want letters of, no en letters of non enforcement. Uh, about six years ago, the town council said to the code enforcement officer, You cannot do letters of non enforcement. Uh, it's, uh, they, they got some advice from the town attorney on the issue and felt very strongly that, that there should be no such letters. And you know, we, we had one last week with someone that had a setback issue. 
and the closing didn't take place, but it's, you know, it's, it's what you deal with with property records, and it's, it's much, much better to solve it when you know you have a problem existing rather than wait for the panic when the, the property is closing. I have, a, I have a question, and I will ask you to help me with any ordinance things. Um, the house uh, on this lot is obviously had some setback challenges when it was constructed because its line is, what, about five feet from that um, Greenbelt area. So that Greenbelt must have been factored in somehow to uh, being able to create a setback from the adjacent lot in order to construct the house. So what, I, what happened in this situation that allowed it to be built in so close to Greenbelt? You know, it, it, the, the setback is you can't have any structure within the setback area. Uh, you know, perhaps, you know, that should have been, that probably should have been picked up at the time of the occupancy permit. However, we, you know, we don't require every time someone does an occupancy permit to give us a new survey that shows that the house is in fact where they, the original plan said it was going to be built. We, we don't require a, a, a final survey. So the house, so when the plan was submitted, when the, because the plan for the subdivision had to be done, and then the person purchases the yeah. lot, and then the person said, and then the developer says, here's where it's going to sit on the, set on the lot. Yeah. And so I have to place it here in order that uh, I can then place another house on the next lot, because they're playing that little, you know, when every house is built, you know, there ought to be a survey that, you know, that the corners are carefully chosen. We had a house in, in uh, Cross Hill five years ago, mm -hmm. and I met with the contractor. He, he, he was in a panic. Uh, he had built a two-story addition, not addition, a two-story part of the house being built. And uh, he wanted to try to go to the zoning board for, for variance. Well, the, the variance procedures don't allow variances to self-created positions. Mm -hmm. And I sat with the contractor and Bruce Smith and said, you have to tear down what you've built. And he did. Uh, it, it does happen, and it was a part of a two-story structure in Cross Hill. And I, I would tell, could tell you the developer, but I don't want to embarrass him. Uh, he, he, he quickly followed what the council asked, what the town asked him to do. Um, are we at the point where we'd like to get a motion on the floor, um, and then we can discuss further? Oh, I had another question. Okay, go ahead. Or we can, you can put a motion on the floor and we can discuss uh, further. I'll allow the council to decide that. If somebody would like to place a motion on the floor, I'd, I'd entertain it now. If not, we can continue discussion before we put a motion. David? Uh, I would put a motion before the council that we deny the appeal of Mr. O'Hearn. Second. Moved and seconded to deny uh, the appeal with Mr. Bohern. Uh, discussion on the motion. Penny, you have some more questions, and then David? Yeah, my question, because I, I think, Mike, you alluded to this. Um, you're, if we agree to this, it's not necessarily saying that we eliminate the pass-through. It's saying that the uh, encroachment and enhancements are what? is kind of the challenge at this point in time. But if the neighborhood wanted to enter into a uh, cooperative you know, plan with the town, that here's how the pass-through would be uh, maintained, that you're, you're alluding to that, that that is a possibility. It's not eliminate this pass-through, it's how might we work co cooperatively uh, and planfully and stay true to the, um, the um, open space and green belt. Absolutely. We, we, we want to continue the green belt and we want to work with the neighbors both short term and long term to work cooperatively. When I say the neighbors, I mean all the neighbors. Right. To work right. short term and long term 
to make sure that it, it achieves the objectives that were originally envisioned. And so the pass-through would still exist and kids can go from neighborhood to neighborhood Absolutely. and bikers can go and everything that happens today. It, um, I, I heard from what you said is one of the concerns might be it's, it, the, it's manicured to the point where people might feel that they can't go on somebody's lawn. Um, and so that seemed to be a concern, but the pass-through would still exist, could still exist. Yeah, if, you know, if this motion passed, what I would try to, what I would do, you know, the motion is now on the floor, is I would send an invitation out to the folks in this area, the folks on Steeplebush, as well as involve the Conservation Commission, saying Let, let's get, get together and talk about it and collaboratively work together. David? The, the reason I made the motion is for all the reasons set forth in the memo that we got from the Conservation Commission. I think it's very important uh, that we abide by the recommendations. That being said, I uh, second what the town manager just said in response to Penny's questions. Uh, and I would also like the town to explore possibly whether there is any way to accommodate the stone wall. If not, then, then so be it. But uh, I would leave it to town staff working with Mr. O'Hearn and, uh, and the neighbors in the, in the vicinity. Thanks, David. Other discussion? Dave. I fully appreciate the position that the town manager has described and what the Conservation Commission has outlined to us with their concerns. Um, I'd like to find a way, and I would think that by refashioning the deed very slightly, um, the stone wall can stay, the ornamental shrubberies can be removed, and perhaps the, uh, the language in the deed can be fashioned in a way that will permit an even more distinctive, clear, green belt walkway. We want to put an obligation on the property owner um, that burdens that property with the maintenance of it. I'd be in favor of that. I'd be in, and you know, with the property owner, with the O'Hearns bearing the cost of uh, including the town's attorney's fees in fashioning that. Um, I don't see it to be the slippery slope that um, is being feared here. Um, you know, I look at the, um, at the drawing of the property with this five-foot setback off the corner of that porch and it's a little stunning that that was ever approved to begin with. Um, but I'd like to see um, something fashioned that doesn't require that that stone wall be removed, especially since the connectivity seems to work very well for the neighborhood. I don't hear anybody complaining that it's somehow inhibiting them other than the fact that Perhaps it looks too much like a lawn. Right. And I would think that, that could be, there could be a demarcation that very clearly marks it as a green belt trail all the way through. I just Sorry. wanted to point out, Councillor Backer, uh, most of the stone wall is on the property of the O'Hearns. Right. It's only a small piece of it that would have to be relocated. Right. I see that. Sir? I just would like to take two seconds to share. Um, my experience yesterday, I went out biking yesterday afternoon and said to my husband, I want to go look at this eight lane farms road because we're just going to talk about it tomorrow night and I can't envision what it looks like. So he said, okay, let's go. So we rode our bikes up Layton Farm and were unable to find the trail that everyone was talking about. And even I was looking at the addresses and I stopped and said, this is eight Layton farms, but there's no green belt here. And he said, yes, there's a green belt, here's the sign. And I said, this, we can't ride our bikes across this person's property. So. We had this long debate, and we finally sort of went to the very edge of the property and rode our bikes across it, and then came across these sort of two trees that were obstructing the path. And so I said, this definitely is not the path. And then we had this debate. We finally went to the other side. In fact, it was, turned around, came back. And then I'm just telling this story by way of saying that I think a compromise. I'm going to support the motion, but I think after that, I think a compromise is in order, because the second phase of my experience was to say, 
this really would be untenable if it turned into woods again and just a natural path because it, it's so starkly not in keeping. It, it looks beautiful, the lawn's beautiful, it fits in perfectly, but it is not discernible as a Greenbelt Trail. I literally couldn't find it. So I guess what I'm saying is I'd love to, I think there's a need to officially recognize that it is in fact town land. It, it's not obvious to anyone but the people living in the neighborhood. But after having done that, I would strongly encourage um, some method by which you could keep it as lovely as it is now, because it really is lovely. So I'm, I guess I'm cheerleading a compromise or a solution that makes everybody happy. Thanks, sir. Uh, David? Uh, I mean, actually, I was on the planning board when this plan was approved. Um, and I think the reason we approved it with such a small setback was that we considered the additional town-owned property that was to come to the town as enlarging, essentially, the setback, although it's sort of in an unofficial sense. Um, I mean, I talked to Mr. O'Hearn today on the phone. I said, well, you know, you bought it, uh, and that seems like a callous response. But so I'm going to echo what uh, Sarah Lennon just said. Um, but I also want to... You know, one of the very first things Mr. O'Hearn said tonight was, yeah, you'd think this was my property. Well, that's sort of the point. Um, you know, it really needs to be, it is the town's property, and we just need to make sure that people feel welcomed onto the Greenbelt Trail through that access way. And I don't think you're opposed to that at all. So I'm sure that working with the town staff we can, and the Conservation Commission, we can come up with something that will work. But I will support the motion. Other discussion on the motion? Uh, I, I too am in agreement with uh, Sarah's comments and uh, with David Sherman's comments. Um, the thing that bother, has bothered me about this whole thing is, is precedent. Um, we have a situation here where we have some very special circumstances, but yet we are, to, to borrow a cliche, we are of rules and not men. Uh, and what does this open the door to us for other situations down the road that we can't foresee it now? Uh, are we going to make concessions or accommodations to every request that comes down the road? Um, I don't know. Um, obviously, I can't predict the future. For me, this is a lot like uh, the flagpole issue on Shore Road that we dealt with several months back. Well, we haven't finished dealing with it yet. but. Um, you have to draw the line somewhere. Where do you draw the line? Well, the line already has been drawn. It's, it's the property line. Uh, clearly, mistakes have been made. They've been mistake, made perhaps by Ms. Theo Hearns, perhaps by the builder, perhaps by the town in, in granting the uh, occupancy permit. Um, the both sides have lawyered up now. Apparently, uh, I don't know if this is going to end here. I, I hope it does, but I hope the concessions that we've talked about in the last few minutes uh, or the, might, might take care of that. Uh, but I do have concerns, and uh, we have heard from our con conservation commission. They are in charge with, uh, with stewarding our open space, and they've been unequivocal in their recommendation. We also have the opinion of the town attorney, and I, uh, I think the town manager has done his job in uh, supporting the town's rights and in seeking uh, legal advice. Uh, so I'll support the motion, uh, but again, I share the... Uh, the other councillors uh, wishes for, for some kind of a positive and, and, and cooperative re resolution. So, other, other comments, discussion? Seeing none, uh, we I do, do a, I have a, okay. sorry, I, I have to ponder things sometimes. I have, how can, okay, how can a piece of property, land, that's a, um, that is uh, going to be open space be used to, um, I guess, assist the uh, construction um, or of a, of a house. So it's used as part of um, the 30 feet from or whatever from the other lot, how can it be used in that instance and, and then when, uh, whether it was inadvertent or whatever, um, a portion of the wall gets built onto that, then you can't do that. So how can it be used in, in two different 
situations for the same house? That's my question. I don't understand. I think it, it, it was always clear that it was town on land and the property line was very clear. It was just that uh, a, a, a but tiny... But then the developer can use it A mistake it was made his, when okay. they built the stone wall and encroached upon the town land by a little bit and it okay. was probably an inadvertent mistake and it's... Yeah. Okay. You okay? Well, what is the exact motion we're voting on? But we'll repeat the motion before we, uh, before we vote on it. I made a motion that we deny the appeal of Mr. O'Hearn. Are we ready to vote on the motion? Would you like further discussion? Do you get to speak as... No. It's not a public hearing. We do have, we do have provision in our rules to allow uh, speakers uh, on an issue. Um, I would ask that if you do wish to speak, you keep your comments brief. Uh, we've had the two major presenters for that side. Um, I would allow probably, well, we have, a, we have a rule that allows a total of 15 minutes and no more than three minutes per speaker. So uh, technically, we will allow it. So if you'd like to speak, uh, come, to the, come to the lectern. And I'd ask if there are others who would like to speak to, to queue up. And I'll keep a tight, uh, tight rein on the time. So. I'm Jenny Bishop, and I live at 10 Leighton Farm Road. I am the neighbor of O'Hearns. The green belt, which is in a natural state, runs behind my backyard. And I have spoken to Mrs. O'Meara, and I've spoken to uh, Mr. Barry about the, the, as a new owner, as a new citizen, a new resident to Maine, what the restrictions and uh, rules and regulations are for the green belt. Um, I feel very strongly and passionately about this cut through because I use it daily for exercise. I'm the one that wrote you the letter um, about the unique circumstance that created this. And I think the key word here that, that seems to be overlooked is um, in the, the, the warranty deed, I thought it was very clear that the, when the land is deeded to the town, that it is to be maintained in the condition of when it's deeded. Here it is, five years later, when, when we bought our land, Joel Fitzpatrick and Kelly Fitzpatrick made this a, a big selling issue that there was a lawn maintained as lawn pass-through between the two developments so that I would be able to always walk back and forth there and that it's open, it's not ticks, it's, it's not um, bittersweet, it's not the natural wild green belt that runs behind my house, that this was a very unique situation um, that was created as the result of the sewer line and it was in fact a manicured lawn was the condition when the land was deeded over. We were told very specifically that that was part of the, the warranty deed, that this would always be manicured, not manicured, maintained as a lawn, not as a natural woodland, um, which is what we have behind our house. Um, so it seems very befuddling to all of us that live in the neighborhood that five years later, all of a sudden now this is being changed and is not intended to be a maintained lawn in keeping with the character of all the other lawns up and down the street. But this is now going to be changed to be the natural state of woodland. Um, yeah, the, the wall does encroach. I don't think anyone's arguing that, but the better argument is how could you build a retaining wall any closer to their house? If O'Hearns do, do indeed are required to remove the corner of that retaining wall, it's really going to mess up the ability to use this walkthrough. Um, I hope you'll reconsider and vote this motion down. Thank you, Jane. Uh, very quickly, my name is Dave Herzer. I live at 7 Layton Farm. And this is, these comments are probably going to have more to do with the discussions we have with the town, Mr. Chairman, uh, later, assuming this goes the way it appears it's going to go. But I do want to say that the warranty deed talks about uh, this plot 
um, being used so as not to unreasonably interfere with the residential character. And I, uh, the photographs that I have here that may be of some interest to folks that I'd be happy to pass from this end on over give a nice pan back look at uh, the residential character of this plot and show that if it deviates much from what it is today, it's not going to be consistent with the residential character of that land. It's going to look out of place. And with all due respect, Mr. Chairman, uh, to some folks' observations or some people's speculations about how difficult it can be to find this trail, I'm relatively new to this neighborhood. I love hiking. I have gone out in search of these green trails. This one here, if anybody initially mistakes it as a lawn or somebody's uh, private property, it actually has, from the photographs, a wooden post that has the green G on it that makes it pretty clear. And in fact, that wooden post is more obvious than many of the others I've tried to find and haven't been able to find. And in fact, uh, keeping the residential character here uh, of this plot, meaning keeping it as a lawn, is going to uh, uh, deal with a problem you've heard some other folks talk about here, which is when I've tried to use some of the other green trails, uh, A, I haven't been able to find them as easily as I could find this one, and B, they really are impassable. So I'm looking forward to a letter from the town, uh, assuming this motion doesn't go the way we'd like it to go, uh, so that we can work together on making sure it's at least u as usable as it is today. Thank you, Dave. Uh, any other, David? <laughs> Oops. Do you? Uh, oh, no. One more. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, Aaron Mosier, 6 Layton Farm Road. It's my planting bed that I did move. Um, luckily, that was before I planted anything in it. Um, <laughs> tomatoes didn't do so well. Um, <laughs> Tell me about it. I had a long list, well, relatively long list of uh, points, but uh, Brian actually very ably <laughs> addressed most of them. Um, I just like to actually um, make sure we actually maintain it as a, as a, as a trail. Um, I do have a fear that it turns into the other Leighton Farm Trail, which is behind my house also, that is completely impassable. And I am also a mountain biker, and I was looking forward to actually going down that hill. Um, and I can't. I tried it last year, and I just cut my feet up, and, and I would have to go chop it down. I'm really concerned that, that um, did, does the town even maintain the, uh, the access? I'm um, looking at the, uh, the attorney's letter from um, uh, Thomas Leahy, and on the second page here, he actually refers to the subdivision ordinance. Uh, a requirement is, and he quotes, common open space recreation areas or other areas to be dedicated by the subdivision applicant shall be maintained to ensure that its use and enjoyment is not diminished or destroyed. We're maintaining it. Um, we're not destroying it. If we stop maintaining it, does the town step in and actually keep the grass mow down and keep the brush down, um, you know, going back to what its original state, it's a sewer, a sewer line. It was dug up, pipes were put in, and it was covered over. There are actually utility covers on a couple of locations through the trail. I believe that the Polo Water District would probably want to maintain access to that as far as getting equipment in there to, to make repairs and such. They don't want trees growing up around their sewer line. Um, so I just want to make sure, and it sounds very promising, that we can actually uh, work together and. Uh, and maintain access to that. I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Okay. Penny and then Dave. I don't know how to exactly do this, but can we add an amendment to or something to the motion that really explicitly states about um, working um, together with the uh, neighborhood in order to develop a, a cooperative plan? with the pass-through? You can propose an amendment and it will have to be accepted by the original mover. Okay. Do I Can't we just trust them? You know, I, if I might, Jim, you know, we've gone on for 45 minutes on this, I think. You know, I, I've stated publicly with the cameras rolling, the meeting being taped, we're going to work with the neighbors, we're going to work cooperatively, but in the end the town's going to maintain its rights and responsibilities as, as, as the property owner. You know, I don't know what more you could add to an amendment you know, that, that tries to capture that uh, better than it's already been memorialized on film. You okay with that? Jim. Would you like to offer an amendment, Paul? I, um, I wasn't going to say anything, but this has gone on so long I feel the need. 
to uh, state a couple of points. One is um, I really think the responsibility lies with the developer. If the developer planted grass and made it look like a lawn and sold it as if it were going to be maintained that way permanently, I think we, we need to look at our developers and have a conversation with them about what town-owned property, what a green belt means in the future so we don't run into this problem again. Second point is that um, we have green belt trails all over town and anybody who would like to can volunteer to work with the conservation committee and clear these trails and maintain them. So that's always available to people. I just want people to know that. Um, but it, it is important that we protect these trails and that we um, maintain the green belt system. We've worked very hard to establish it. It's a wonderful aspect of uh, uh, Cape Elizabeth and we all should be able to take advantage of it. So I'll be supporting the amendment, I, excuse me, not the amendment, the uh, position, the uh, motion that was made because I think it's important that we maintain integrity in terms of the, the town doing the right thing. But I also know Michael very well, and I know he will work with the neighbors and with the property adjacent to the, to the green belt. And I'm sure we can come up with a good solution. Thanks, Paul. David? Yeah, I just, in response to one of the comments that were made about protecting the cut through and the fear that somehow this cut through was going to disappear. Um, there's nothing about the motion that will jeopardize the cut through. In fact, the cut through is required to exist under the terms of the deed. It may not be a manicured lawn cut through, but it will still be a cut through that you can ride on and bike on and whatever you need to do to get from one place to another. That's the whole idea of the, the trail system. Um, interestingly, looking at the deed, it you know, requires that it be preserved in its existing condition. We've heard comments today that there was a sewer line that was dug up to go through there. Um, there's no date on the deed that we have, but it looks like it was signed sometime in 2003. I have no idea when the deed was actually signed and what the condition of this property was on the day the deed was signed that is to be preserved in its existing condition. I mean, maybe it was a mud bog on the date that it was, the deed was signed. I have no idea. Um, maybe somebody can shed some light on that, but it sounds like maybe it wasn't a wild area for its existing condition on the date of the deed. So I'll support the motion, but again with the understanding that the town's gonna work with the neighborhood to make sure that the cut through continues to exist in some well-defined, demarcated fashion that lets it continue to work for the two neighborhoods. Thank you, David. Further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, uh, all in favor of the motion to deny Mr. O'Hearn's request. It's unanimous, 7-0. Thank you. And thank you all for, for coming out tonight. Um, I know a lot of you are here for that issue. Uh, if you could exit just as quickly as you possibly could. We have another meeting after this one, so uh, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, item number 150-2009. Uh, we have before us some proposed revised fees for the picnic shelter and bandstand use at Fort Williams. The Fort Williams Advisory Commission, uh, of which uh, Dan Chase, the chairman, is here tonight, has recommended revised fees for use of the picnic shelter, bandstand, and gazebo at Fort Williams Park. Uh, I don't know that we need a setup for this. We had pretty good explanation in the, in the packet. So I'd entertain a motion at this time. Dave? I move that we adopt the proposed revised fees for the picnic shelter and bandstand use proposed by the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Second. Move and second it. Uh, discussion on the motion. 
Sure. I, I'm fearful of asking a question because I don't want to make it go on any longer. So <laughs> I'll make my question rhetorical. I'm just curious why the fees didn't go up more in light of how eager we all are to raise revenue. Dan, would you like to come to the mic? So it's not incremental, that? it's flat. There's no increase. <laughs> Dan Chase, 26 Stony Brook Road. Uh, we, Bob Malley and I got together with um, Pat Fowler and Janet at Community Services and, and we kind of talked about um, what they were getting for feedback when people called to inquire about rental rates and uh, you know, it seems to be a fair amount of pushback on some of these fees, so we didn't get them. It's just curious. Thanks, Dan. Further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion to adopt the new fees as proposed, unanimous, 7-0. Thank you. We now offer our uh, second and final citizen opportunity for discussions of items not on tonight's agenda. Seeing none, um, I have just a couple announcements of upcoming gatherings. Uh, the 2010 Town Council is tentatively scheduled to hold the annual caucus at 9.40 p.m. Uh, or at the conclusion of the Town Council meeting, which should come out just about right. Um, future meetings, uh, we, have, we have on the calendar a workshop showing for this Thursday, November 12th. Uh, as of now, uh, that is off. It will not be a workshop this Thursday at, at uh, and the next regular meeting of the uh, Cape Elizabeth Town Council is Monday, December 14, 2009. So I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you all very, very much.